we've always been connected, we perhaps weren't aware that we were connected. Welcome listeners to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here with Andrew Ginter, Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Graham Speak. Graham is uh, you know, someone I've known for a long time. He's been uh, involved in the cybersecurity field for a long time, and he's just retired, or at least semi-retired. So I, uh, I asked him if he'd join us and reflect on you know, his very long career in the industry. All right, then without further ado, here's you and Graham. Hello, Graham, and uh, thank you for joining us. Before we get started, can you uh, tell us a bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure, Andrew. Uh, as I said, my name's Graham Speak. Uh, I've been working in industry some 40 years, um, retired back in November from Accenture, where I was a senior manager, um, working in their uh, industrial security group, primarily oil and gas, but did some electric, electric distribution. Um, my background has been a lot in the oil and gas for the last uh, 20 odd years um, and also in my really early career when I worked for some oil and gas companies. Um, I've also worked for a an actual end uh, end user, a big oil and gas company. Um, I've worked for a, a startup called Next Defense, which is no longer with us, um, who was in the anomaly detection space in the uh, in the industrial security world. Um, I've also worked for a vendor, Yokogawa, um, and traveling back and forth to uh, Japan on a, a monthly basis, which uh, always takes takes it hard on the body. Um, and basically sort of worked in security in general um, since about 1996. Um, so, yeah, been uh, doing a lot of things over my career, um, say retired in November, but then uh, I did recently join Waterfall on a part-time basis for a, a couple of days a week. Um, so I had about two or three days retirement and then Andrew and others persuaded me to come back at least part time. Can we start with, um, you know, you, you say you got involved in security in 96. And I imagine industrial security, you know, then or shortly thereafter. Um, when you got into the industrial security space, or even the security space, what, what was it like back then? What, what were we dealing with? Well, initially, I was dealing mainly with um, banks, financial institutions. I mean, they, there was a lot of change. In, I was in the UK. There's a lot of change, and they were putting in firewalls, um, email uh, security checks. Uh, but it was very early days. So, you know, people were going, oh, yes, let's let's get a firewall or two in there, have a DMZ. Um, and it was people just didn't really do a lot you know they were putting some antivirus in but perhaps not everywhere um, and certainly things weren't pushed out it was more of a okay let's do this little part here because it's probably at higher risk um, and then yeah as I said I moved I joined uh, oil and gas company in 2000 um, and started to do a bit of um, it was more IT security to start with, putting in WebSense and checking what people were doing on the web. But then in 2001, we had 9-11. And then suddenly it was like, oh, wonder what we got in our industrial space. And in, in a sort of prior to, to joining them, um, I had done our work in industrial areas. So I had a, a background in industrial uh, manufacturing um, and some oil and gas and some distributed control systems. So it was, I started to help out and go in, okay, well, let's look at our plants. And at that time, there was very little to no security um, in any of these plants. Um, you know, this was even pre, pre firewall. So it was like things were just joined or. It might have been air gapped in inverted commas, but it really wasn't because you know they were sending data back. So it was it was very eye opening to go. Oh, we've done all this in the IT space, and you know we've been trying to push out antivirus and firewalls, and then you had all this 
these plants that had virtually nothing and then as you look at them they go oh and you're not even up to date on patches or versions of operating system or anything so it was a case then of going okay well we need to do something very quickly and you know you we put in firewalls and then you think you've got to do monitoring and oh how do we do monitoring and it was a it was very seat of your pants no real um method to what we were doing but we had to do something very quickly because we didn't know what the next threat was going to be um and certainly round about that time 2002 2003 there were a lot of um viruses coming out um you know i know certain plants were affected to a certain degree and you know it it changed the mindset very quickly from having nothing to having to do something within like three to four years um and at the same time with things like isa 99 as it was then you know coming out as well and going okay well we need to try to get some more policies and procedures because we realized you know people every plant was doing something different you know they installed a a pi server as they wanted they installed you know a any other piece of equipment as they wanted. There was nothing guiding them to do something in a secure way or even a consistent way across the whole company. So things change very quickly. Um, and, you know, it was very different, I think, to what we have now when, you know, people do understand OT security and process control networks. At that time, there was very little interaction between the plant and what your IT people did. You know, the IT people did the business network and the business computers, the laptops. They didn't know anything about the rest of it. So um, it was certainly very, very eye-opening those first few years of trying to get everything done um, and then working through, well, let's get a vendor to help us with the monitoring and then having to teach the vendor, well, this is an OT network, so you need to have these types of attacks mo measured more than others because these are the ones that would really affect it. And for them to understand, oh, we've got Modbus here and we've got other industrial protocols, which they'd never heard of. So it it was a very much a big learning uh, experience for, for the entire industry. So Andrew, as the resident old person on this podcast, does Graham's experience vibe with you? Uh, yeah, resident old person. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> it does. I mean, Graham's got the the jump on me in the industry by a couple of years. I mean, in the uh, you know post nine eleven when OT security really started taking off, um, I was leading development teams. I was leading product development teams, so I was tracking security technology, but not really tracking what the industry was doing. What customers were doing. I didn't sort of start getting out in front of customers until I started helping with uh, with sales, understanding customers' needs and so on in sort of the mid-2000s, you know, 06, 07, something like that. But, you know, what I, what I will observe is that back in the mid-1990s, I mean, I remember 1995, I was working for, uh, I think it was HP at the time, started up a project that eventually migrated to Agilent when they spun us off, HP split back in the, in the day. Um, but we started building a product that was an ITOT middleware, enterprise link, we called it, connected control systems to SAP. And this is because people wanted the benefits of, of you know, business automation in their industrial enterprises. I recall, you know, I, I don't ever remember being asked the question, you know, what ports have to be open? How can a firewall be put between, you know, the, the two networks so that your stuff still works? That question just never came up. It never came up until the, the early 2000s. You know, firewalls back then, I was working for HP. We had T1 leased lines between all of our offices. The only firewall that I recall in the, in the company, in my experience, was between the HP network and the internet at head office. So, yeah, you know, in the early days, the, the, the late 1990s, we started connecting the networks together and, uh, you know, didn't really think about the, the, the consequences there. And that kind of evolution makes sense to me. But what I'm still not clear about is why 9-11 in general would pertain to industrial security mindset specifically. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the Again, I was in the back office doing technology at the time, but what I've heard, you know, 
one expert after another who was involved say is that it was sort of a uh, it, it was the the question that a lot of authorities were asking and the question that you know because these authorities were asking them very publicly was in the minds of practitioners all over the world um the question was you know this was a massive breach of physical security clearly we have to do something on the airline side but it was also a failure of imagination nobody imagined that this could happen and so people were asking the question you know deliberately in public what else have we not imagined and people were looking around and one of sort of the the gestalt consensus things that came up was oh shoot industrial security critical infrastructures cyber security viruses everywhere that has to be fixed and that was it was sort of a consequence of what else have we not imagined yeah you know it's always been my perhaps misguided assumption that it would have been Stuxnet, which really changed the industry, because that was a case, you know, the the big one of our time, where an industrial security sp- facility specifically was breached in a highly targeted, sp- uh, sophisticated and destructive way. Did Stuxnet have any kind of impact to the level in your experience that 9-11 did? Well, Stuxnet had an impact. Um, it was, you know, it was big news. Um but the impact is less than I think everyone in the industry expected. I saw Stuxnet happen, and you know, I was all over it. I, I you know, I, I actually got a copy of the worm. I was, you know, trying to help analyze it, trying to draw conclusions. I, I wrote, uh, co-wrote an influential paper, paper with uh, with Joel Engel and Eric Byers on on the topic. But in the end, um, the impact was less than I expected. I think less than a lot of people expected. And I think in hindsight, the uh, the reason was that a lot of, of owners and operators looked around and said, okay, Symantec has identified Stuxnet as the most sophisticated, the most complex, the most powerful cyber attack the company has ever seen. How likely is it that the most sophisticated, the most powerful cyber attack ever is going to target my little power plant? Not likely. And so I think a lot of people, you know, other than maybe the very biggest operators discounted Stuxnet and sort of waited for the next shoe or six to drop before taking action. So that that's my recollection. Did you know that power plants are exempt from one quarter of NERC-SIP requirements when those plants use Waterfall's unidirectional security gateways? NERCSIP does not demand that power plants use the gateways, but the regulations recognize the strength of unidirectional protections. The regulations reward sites who use gateways by dramatically reducing the number of security rules for those plants. For details on the exemptions, please download Waterfall's latest report on the NERCSIP standards. You can find the report on the waterfall-security.com website in the Resources tab under eBooks and White Papers. The first web browser was invented in 1990. I remember playing with with a version of it in 1991. I was I was in grad school. I remember in in about 95 96 we started uh, connecting uh, lots of control systems to SAP. I was at uh, um, HP or Agilent Technology, I forget which, and and we uh, we were we're deploying the Enterprise Link product. Um, and you know the what's the right word the uh, the story that everyone tells about industrial cybersecurity is that oh everything used to be air gapped um, but now it's not anymore and so we need security. I'm struggling to remember a time when the industrial systems were air gapped. They were always connected to something. I mean, can you talk about that? I'll go back even further. I mean, in the early 80s, I worked for a company called Industrial Control Systems, and we were we made um, emergency shutdown and fire and gas systems. Um, so we, we were developing one of the first ones and putting a computer in it, and we were going to deploy it on one of the platforms. They went, oh, hang on, you need to connect it to the DCS that we've got back on shore. Um, so we need to do that protocol. And in, all of a sudden, you know, these industrial control systems and emergency systems sitting on the on the platform were being connected back to a DCS with absolutely, we never even thought about security. So 
And I know that DCS was connecting to multiple platforms. So even back then, nothing was really air gap because this was a the DCS was some mini computer back in those days sitting on an IT network. And I don't know what it was joined to. You know, look, thinking back now, I would go, oh, my God, why are we connecting the emergency safety system and the fire and gas back to the IT network? But we just did it. We didn't even think about it. And and even in the future, you know, I work for Ford Motor Company. We just connected everything together. We, we never air gapped them. I, and I'm sure there were some industries that did, perhaps nuclear. But most of us, we didn't think about security. There wasn't a risk. So why should we go through that, you know, put an air gap there when we need to easily talk to each of these systems and bring the data back? So, yeah, I, I think we've always been connected. We perhaps weren't aware that we were connected. Okay, so that's what it was like in the beginning. Can you talk about change? What change have you seen? What strikes you as remarkable about the last 20 years? I, I think it is the extent that in the sort of the OT security world, how far we have come. And I think people keep knocking the industry, and I think people keep pushing back and going, oh, OT security is not good. You know, companies are not doing it. I think the the products are out there, the the knowledge is out there. People are aware of it. And, and I think if everybody does things correctly, and there are companies out there who do it, the security in the OT space is just as good, and I might even say might be slightly better than the IT space. You know, with the things that we've got, you know, we're not just relying on one thing anymore. You know, yes, we have firewalls. We have, you know, unidirectional gateways. We have antivirus deployed. But then we've got all these things that we just use in the OT space of, you know, products that will do the inventory check-in and will do anomaly um, inspection. So there's an awful lot that we do do in the OT world. And I think it's come a lot far further than I thought it would do. Um, and, you know, I think we could make an OT network very resilient and immune to attack, perhaps, you know, not completely, but, you know, really good. Um, and I think better than an IT network. I think particularly the large ones when the IT networks have opened up to so many things and everybody wants, oh, I want internet access. I want to connect every single machine in the network. Um, and it all requires one person to make a, a click on an email and you know, a, a defender, a, an attacker is in there and it's hard to defend against. Whereas I think with the OT network, we've now realized they're fairly static. We've got a lot of good tools that can protect them. And I think we could do some really good protection in an OT network that people could sit back and go, okay, well, let's now more concentrate on the IT networks rather than the OT ones because I think they're fairly good. Um, you know, there's nothing's going to be perfect, but it's it's better than I ever would have thought. You know, even 10, 15 years ago, I was still looking at going, well, should we use whitelisted and things like that to protect? And all these other tools have come out now where it goes, well, we, we can spot things that are happening very quickly send the data out, but, you know, we can have um, socks that will ma monitor industrial networks and controls, and those people understand what that is. Um, and it, it certainly has, I think, come um, leaps and bounds over what we were 20 years ago. And, you know, sometimes I don't think we, we pat ourselves on the back for, oh, yes, as a group of people who've lived this for 20 years and have actually d have made a difference to uh, OT security in general um, and actually made, a, will say, a safer world. Cause I think we have done an awful lot here um, and, you know, we, sh we should congratulate ourselves. I take Graham's point there about IT versus OT, you know, as I've always understood it, IT is much more vulnerable, but the consequences of OT breaches is tends to be much more severe. That said, um, he's going a little bit further, I think, than I've ever heard before, saying essentially that OT is relatively okay. Isn't the 
whole point of the existence of this podcast that industrial security has a lot of issues that are yet to be solved. Well, Graham made a, a couple of points there. Um, let's start with uh, you know that you know the, the point he made about OT networks being in a sense easier to secure. Um, they you know OT networks are less exposed to the internet to people bringing laptops and you know cell phones and whatnot and connecting to the to the IT networks. Um, OT networks are much more controlled. They are change controlled. They're more stable. You can so you can use that stability to to uh, you know that that's an opportunity uh, for exploiting stability for cybersecurity that you know for for uh, locking down anomaly detection locking down firewall rules in ways that just aren't possible on IT networks so there's opportunities there and part of his answer um, when it comes to uh, the you know things being much more secure than other people give them credit for I think might have to do with his industry experience because yeah in my experience uh, in the oil and gas field um, their security on average is much more secure or much more mature than uh, in in many other industries but you know i ask him about industries in a moment but there is an emerging issue even in organizations where the ot networks are locked down tight you know those ot systems they often depend on it systems for for second by second you know correct operation of the ot systems and the IT systems are not locked down and it really cannot be locked down as tight as we're able to lock down some of the OT systems. This is also something that, uh, you know, I, I asked Graham about uh, a couple of questions in. So let's go back and, and listen into Graham here. So that's interesting. This is, you're the first guest I've had in 60 episodes who said that, uh, you know, on average, we're doing a good job. Um, Pretty much everybody else is is ragging on the industry, saying you know not enough, not enough, not enough. Um, is, is this you know is this uh, is this you know specific to the 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 part of the industry that you're that you're most familiar with, or you know is this a general observation? What you know can can you talk about about how widely this applies? Yeah, um, you know I've looked okay, so I've worked in a lot of oil and gas, um, both all the way from upstream midstream and downstream so and i think everyone there you know i won't say everybody's doing the really good job but i think everybody in those that is the industries i've worked with understands ot security and is willing to put money into deploying tools uh, training their staff and put in the correct monitoring um and updates and upgrades and looking at the systems rather than just going, I'll put a tool in and ignore it. Um, I think most oil and gas companies are doing something. Um, I did electric distribution and a lot of the bigger companies in that are doing the same thing. They're putting stuff out in small substations to monitor all the traffic and if there's an anomaly, uh, report it. Um, so I think... The industry I have seen, yes, people are trying to do something better, and it seems to it is improving and is 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 doing better than I thought it would do. Um, there's always some exceptions. Obviously, that I think there'll be certain sectors such as water that always struggle for money and cash, so they're probably always going to be slightly behind, um, and the way that people upgrade systems yeah i think they still need to consider if they put a large system in they've got to upgrade it more often and sometimes they do fall be fall behind the curve a bit but i think they they put enough other um safeguards in place so they may not be perfect but i think they're they're doing a, a good job i know that our topic is uh, reflections on a career in ot security but you know um, even if we say, even if we say, okay, uh, in at least most of oil and gas installations, uh, in those installations, OT networks are locked down tight. Look at recent events. Uh, in the United States, the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA, has just ordered petrochemical pipeline companies to implement a whole lot of new security measures. This was a reaction to the Colonial Incident. 
One of the the principles, the themes in the order is to change the security systems, you know, make a lot of changes, change them to the point where the pipeline will keep running, even if the IT network goes down again from ransomware or some other attack. But the problem I'm seeing is dependencies. If the second-by-second operation of the pipeline depends on access to IT systems, and if those IT systems have been crippled, well, you know, then it doesn't matter how secure we've made the OT network, does it? So, you know, what does it really mean that we have good OT security in place? Yeah, I. it's obviously not an easy fix. But yes, I think where we draw the line for the IT-OT boundary has typically in the past been very low down and you're isolating a smaller section of the network than we perhaps should. And we regularly put out data to, oh, let's put the Pi server on the IT network. Let's put purchasing or where we hold the recipes, all that on the IT network. But those are all devices that are essential for the OT op- networks to operate. So I think where we draw that line needs to be perhaps rethought and go, okay, well, what do we need? What do we absolutely need? What can we cut off and still then keep the pipeline, the platform or whatever running and not worry? So we, it might be that we have to look at it and go, okay, well, say if it's a Pi server, when well, you can do that easy, you put the Pi server on the control network and we just do a replication back. And so you're doing a one-way replication, no problem. You could cut the link, you're still running. We perhaps should look at all the other IT-centric systems that we have that that the the OT network depends on and decide where they should be. Um, And perhaps have to isolate them on the IT network and put boundaries around there so they might still sit on the IT network but not generally available, you know, whether it's, you know, using a a unidirectional firewall, whether it's doing something else to protect them in the event of something happening on the IT network and allowing those, the OT networks to still operate. Um, So I think, yeah, I think otherwise we're always going to be in that situation where if one of the servers that you rely on on the OT network is on the IT network and you have a, something running around the IT network, you will automatically shut off your, your OT network because you can't trust it. Um, so we do need to rethink architecture. And I think we've always, in the past, tried to put more or less stuff in the OT network and more in the IT network because our IT people like to monitor it, manage it, and it was easier. And the OT people could go, okay, well, I'll just manage these few things I really want without thinking about the longer term um, problem here. Okay. So, so you came into, you know, you, you came into the security industry first in banking. You, you, you did some work there. You wound up in doing industrial security. Um, you know, it sounds like you brought an IT perspective to the table initially, like a lot of a lot of practitioners do. You're now, you know, deeply embedded in the in the industrial security mindset. Um, you know, how has your perspective on security, on industrial security, changed over the years? Yeah, I, I think that that's correct. And you know, I think when I first moved more back into the industrial security, it was bringing in what I'd learned in banking. Well, let's put firewalls in. Let's deploy antivirus. Um, That sort of evolved over a few years and then whitelisting products were coming out and it was, okay, yes, this could be, you know, the really thing that we we could use and uh, deploy and well be really secure then. Um, But as you start looking at how these products work, I was sort of adapted, well, yeah, I can see it does work, but management is hard, or I've got to save the data for all this somewhere else. Um, so I've had to continually modify and adapt my thoughts of what would work, um, both in terms of what my IT background was, but also just looking at what this, what devices 
and what procedures and policies and um, everything that we're putting in the OT space, what's going to work best for the end user in that space rather than what is good for the IT practitioner and the IT um, part of the company? So through the years, um, you know, you've been involved in the space. Um, you've worked, you've mentioned a bunch of different technologies. Can you talk about the evolution of technology in the industrial security space? What, what have you seen and, and, you know, maybe where's it going? You know, I think when, I, when we first started, we were putting in firewalls. Um, they were IT firewalls. You know, they didn't understand absolutely any of the industrial protocols if it was anything other than an IT protocol. So Modbus and et cetera, they didn't know. Um, so certainly in terms of the edge devices, there are now lots of edge devices that understand industrial protocols. And that has come leaps and bounds. You know, I think people put a few in some of their tools initially, but now they're just about any industrial protocol um, is available. And along with that, you know, they've done the same with all of the other monitoring tools, the IDS, um, IPS. They all know and listen for industrial protocols. Um, yeah, obviously, if you've got something weird and wonderful, it might not, but anything that's fairly common um, across industries and not, you know, manufacturing, oil and gas, medical, uh, you know, electric generation, distribution, the standard protocols are known um, and everybody can understand them. Uh, also, a lot of the security tools, um, they will also, if they're looking at protocols, they will, they built in all the industrial protocols as well. So I think from people not understanding anything to do with an industrial protocol and what a PLC is and all the other devices to now you could look and Google and find so much more. So I think all industry has realized that in the industrial space, people want good security. They want to put all tools in that will understand their networks and protocols. And they're now available. They're now available virtually off the shelf um, and you can get all everything you want um, so that I think has been the the really big change um, in terms of technology that has happened over the last 20 years I'd really like to second Graham's point there I think that uh, in the course of doing this podcast for a couple of years just the the volume and diversity of folks we've talked about, the kinds of security solutions that have been discussed on this show that never otherwise would have occurred to me, but solve unique problems in interesting ways. Um, it really does feel like there are a lot of really interesting solutions to problems in industrial security and that our show is sort of a testament to it. Well, I agree. Um, you know, there's a lot of technology, OT security technology out there now where there really wasn't a decade ago. And yes, you know, that technology is a, is a continuing theme in these episodes. But I'll tell you, I'm still regularly surprised by the work that needs to be done. I mean, you know, I, I agree with Graham. You know, what he said that common OT systems and communications protocols and, you know, stuff that's used across a lot of industries, there's a lot of support for that stuff nowadays in modern firewalls, in modern unidirectional gateways, in modern intrusion detection systems. What surprises me is the work that's left to do. I mean, you know, for example, I've recently been coming up to speed on railways railway system applications and protocols and networks and you know i see a lot of stuff that's unique to rail systems i see stuff over there that i just never heard of in sort of you know the standard ot security support out there so you know i agree that the the, the widespread protocols now you know and the widespread applications are now well supported out there I'm guessing we still have a few episodes left on the new stuff that's that's coming out as more and more, I don't know, call them specialized industries start digging deeper into their own security issues. So, you know, I, I don't know that we'll, we'll run out of material anytime soon. So that all makes sense. Um, you know, we're, we're coming up on, on the end of the episode here. Um, you know, can we, can we ask you to put your, your crystal ball in front of you again? Um, you know, what are 
today's biggest challenges? What needs to change? How do you see things changing into the future? Even though the IT and the OT disciplines are now working closer together, there's still some friction between all the groups. And I think you need to get those groups working closer together, but also working together on how best to put security tools in, put, uh, you know, where you put everything, what you need to do, um, and try to get that cross-discipline in a much closer environment together in a company. Um, you know, if the IT people are coming up with things, they quite often looking at the, the IT network as an as a isolation, and the same with the OT people. With, they need to work together, and particularly in, in more long-term plans. Um, with, especially with the OT world, we don't seem to change things as often as the IT world. You know, they'll change, you know, network switches and uh, where they're putting things, what antivirus tool they're using. But you need to involve the OT people in a lot of those discussions, um, which they haven't done in the past, and you quite often have two distinct groups. Um, so we need need to get, the, I think, that integration working better. Um, I think if you don't, you're still going to get the problems of something happens on the IT world and it affects the OT world, you know, whether it's, you know, just some reconfiguration or whether it's um, some malware that gets onto the IT network and then can filter down. So we are doing some good jobs, but we just need to, get that interaction going a lot better um, to avoid any major disruption of a plant or a network, a pipeline, a, an oil and, oil and gas platform, whatever. Um, so yeah, get that interaction going and making sure everybody's working to the same aim. So this has been great. Uh, Graham, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, before we let you go, is there a thought you'd like to leave with our listeners? I, th I think the thought is, as an industry, we are doing, I think, better than most people think. Um, but we can't sit back on our laurels. We do need to keep evolving, keep looking at what we're, we're doing, and never think that we are invincible and we're not, we're totally uh, immune to any external or internal attacker. We, you always have to keep your guard up. Keep evolving, keep putting in and looking at new, whether it's security uh, bits of hardware or security policies or uh, anything. You just got to keep evolving and making sure that we do keep um, any attacker out as much as we can. Um, we we are we can do more. We can keep putting in uh, new tools, new devices, but never put in a device just for the sake of it. Always make sure that whatever you put in, it fits your organization. And if you need to do monitoring on it, make sure you're doing that regular monitoring on it. You know, make sure you you build in the the sort of the operating costs as well as just putting in the capital costs because otherwise it's just a piece of hardware that will sit there and not actually do any good for you. Um, and I think, yeah, I think if you're in the industry, just, you know, perhaps pat yourself on the back once or twice and say, yeah, you know, even though people are keep hitting us, you know, we have done a good job, but we can still do better and we still need to improve. So, Andrew, as a last word here, uh, do you agree with Graham? Are we better off than we've ever been? Well, I think that's, in a sense, that's an easy answer. Yes, we are better off than we've ever been. People have done stuff in the last 20 years of, of OT cybersecurity, and, and that's improved the situation. Um, I think the, the question is not, are we, you know, are we better off than we were? The question is, how much is enough? Is what we've done enough? And this is the question that we explore one episode after another in, in uh you know, in this podcast. So um, I think there's there's always stuff that can be done. And the question is, uh, you know, 
how much of it should we do and where should we do it? You know, are there differences between industries, between sites, between large and small organizations? This is what we look at going forward. All right. Well, thanks to Graham Speak for speaking with you, Andrew. And as always, Andrew, thank you for speaking with me. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everyone out there listening.